Well, thank you for that introduction. Anytime you hear introduction like that, you know you're getting old. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, over the years, I have given about four or 500 talks. I visited literally over 100 you know, departments. I have to say, today, when I walk into this department, I say, wow, I've never seen a department that's so grandiose. And uh, people are just incredibly nice. And uh, NC has been incredibly staff person and you guys just lucky and uh, so I want to congratulate you first for being in such a great great department and the second I want to congratulate for living in Canada <laughs> uh, you understand what I mean but um, so uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, it's, it's a kind of a slightly unusual talk uh, I will be talking these three topics mostly on this election I want to show you the importance of data quality and that's is part of my recent research. I will talk about gerrymandering as well as the uh, differential privacy protection census because that they creates a lot of new problems that for people to uh, for people to work on. Now these are all the things sort of in the United States, but there are statistical consequences are you know very broad. And uh, but before I do that, I wanted to uh, say a few words really in my as. Uh, but Chen mentioned that I'm now uh, uh, the founding editor of the Harvard Data Science Review. I want to say a few words about data science. It's a question everybody's asked, what is data science? And now, I can stop the talking now, just sort of start a debate with you what a data science is. That could be, you know, kill the entire hour that easily, and, uh, but, but I won't do that. But I do want to, uh, since I'm a statistician, I do want to uh, uh, collect a little bit of data. I know this is a talk in the stat department, but how many of you are actually coming from outside the statistics and actuary science departments, any of you? Okay, all right, so a few of you, and uh, uh, welcome to this uh, large stat community, and because uh, the data science itself has become really very broad. So uh, let me start by, There are so many books now written on data science, and uh, uh, this is one of them, and this one is written by two computer scientists, and uh, their first page is, what is data science? Now, <clears throat> let me read a little bit, because um, it's interesting. It said, data science encompasses a set of principles, problem definition, the algorithm, and the process for extract now obvious and useful patterns from large data sets. All right? It's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> many of the elements of data science have been developed in related fields such as machine learning and data mining. All right, right there, all the statisticians say, where is statistics? Uh, well, let's read on, see if there's statistics. In fact, the term da terms data science, machine learning, and data mining are often used interchangeably. The commonality across these disciplines is a focus on improving decision making through the analysis of data. However, although the data science borrows from these other fields, it's broad in scope. Machine learning focuses on design, data mining, data science, all of these things, but there's no mentioning of statistics whatsoever. Okay? Now you may say, well, that's just first page. Or read the entire book. All right? You will not find anywhere mentioning statistics except at one place. And that turned out to be quite related to your department. So not too long ago, I was invited to attend a, a, a celebration of a birthday of a person. I hope at least some of you remember him. He used to be in this department. Jeff Wu, OK? Now, some of you new students, you probably don't know. He was here 1980-something to 1994, right? And it was, uh, it was an event to celebrate his 70th birthday. I was invited to be the speaker for the banquet. So this was my title. Is Jeff Wu a data scientist? Why do I do that? Well, because Jeff now, I don't know how many people know that, that he has been really credited for as one of the pioneers early on, thinking about statistics go, go beyond statistics into data science. In fact, uh, in this book, he was credited. This, this is a little bit from the book. Uh, in 1997, he gave a public lecture when he moved to uh, the University, University of Michigan. And he had a talk called, the title was Statistics Equal to Data Science with a question mark. OK, this is 1997. You have to think about the, the timeline, right? Now, at that time, that Jeff's view of data science then 
is not what we talk about data science now. Because at that time, he was really thinking about how to rebranding uh, statistics to have this more broad emphasis on practicality, connected with the practice, sort of thinking about, thinking about data science, particularly thinking about these large complex data. So he was truly visionary to anticipate that something is going to happen, although I guess you know, I talked to him that he didn't expect that the data science now become such a general term that uh, it certainly goes beyond both statistics and computer science. Just for those who have not met Jeff, this was Jeff before he became a data scientist, and this was Jeff afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> now, I want to sort of say a little bit, of, a few words about Harvard Data Science Review because that actually is where I have been in the last one and a half years, spend most of my time, talk to all kinds of people, really helped me to think about data science as a broad, as I would tell you that it's not even single discipline uh, in the end. Um, so the idea of Harvard Data Science Review is really coming out of, uh, inspired by the Harvard Business Review, which is a popular magazine for all the Fortune 500 company and other business leaders, as well as the Harvard Law Review, which is a legal uh, scholar journal. And so the, the, when, I, when I started thinking about the Harvard Data Science Review, I was really thinking about this. I want to do both. I want to do the kind of uh, scholarly, you know, deep-end research. I also want to reach out to the industry, government, everyone, because that's what data science is now. It's not just an academic field. It's, it's a very broad. But on top of these two, this is sort of my ambitious plan, which I'm implementing it, is I want also include education component. Where are universities? University, a key mission of university is educated. That's why most of you are, you are here. So we'll be also publishing a lot of articles on data science education. So this is a place where we publish research education as well as that kind of outreach public, uh, you know, this. So I wrote an editorial uh, for the first issue, summarizing the first 14 articles in this journal. And it's everything's online free, okay? So you just Google it. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, it's you know everything's free. So in this particular article, uh, this editorial, I emphasize this point. I was using this term called ecosystem because I couldn't find a way to describe data science become such an interconnected system with so many pieces that it really goes uh, you know goes goes very very broad. And in which particularly I define data science as part of being. I had a training as a pure mathematician. You know, in mathematics, when we can't describe something, it's too broad, you define it according to the complement. It's much easier to talk about what is not. So I basically made this point for this group. I'm going to go very quickly because it's sort of obvious. Um, uh, first is I want to emphasize data science is not just about machine learning and it's not just about statistics. Either way will be too narrow because you will see, uh, uh, you know, there are these things. Are uh, we we all the, we we need all kinds of methodologies. Data science is not just about a prediction, although mostly in the industry, prediction is a very important problem. But data science itself is really about inference, about classification, about a lot of a lot of other things. Data science is not just about a data analysis, and that's the one. Typically, for statisticians, we might have not appreciated this as much as people who actually doing, dealing with these big data, you know, for anyone dealing with big data, these dirty ones, what they call the you know, dirty data, uh, you're spending literally like 80, 90% of the time cleaning the data, trying to make the work, trying to run anything. The analysis part is really comes later. So I think that's important for us to really understand this part as well. And this is the part I'm starting to think about really more broadly. I want to emphasize data science is not a discipline sit merely within the STEM field. STEM is for science, technology, engineer, and mathematics. Because that's the traditional, I don't know if you use the term in Canada, but in the US, that's a quite a common term. Now, we obviously, you know, obviously this is a very important part, right? Computer science, statistics, statistics uh, operation research, all in, in STEM field. But, you know, I'm, in a minute I'm going to give you some specific example to really help you to think about the data science itself is really more broad than just think about as, as a STEM field. I'm, I'm going to tease you a little bit about this last point. So this is the three articles in the first issue. In the middle, this article was, was uh, done by a computer scientist, but there's also an article done by a, a social scientist, as well, done, as well as an article by, uh, by a philosopher 
from, you know, from humanity. And I want to just show you these articles in, in a little bit more detail to illustrate this whole point about why I think the data science has become so broad. This was an article done by Jeanette Wing. Um, I don't know how many of you know Jeanette Wing. She is a computer scientist. She's the director of the Data Science Institute at uh, Columbia. And uh, she is known for this concept called computational thinking. Uh, in contrast to statistical thinking. And this is the, her view, and she has a particular sort of pretty uh, nice, crisp way of defining what data science is. But the most importantly, she talked about this data life cycle. And for most of us, probably think that this is pretty good uh, description. She talked about your know, data generation, collections, processing, right? Processing and storage, management, analysis. It's very important, but it's only one of many visualization and you know, interpretation. And along this whole way, you also have to worry about all the privacy and the ethics sort of consideration. This can become increasingly important and for really good reasons, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in, in, in a minute. Um, so when you look at this thing, I think most of us will probably agree this is a pretty, pretty good description. Um, then until I have a philosopher comes in and also a, a, you know, a, a social scientist coming, so this, uh, Sabina Leonelli, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, she is a, she is a, she is a philosopher. And her point, she actually wrote an article as well. The way she thinks about this whole thing is that she emphasized, like, before you do all those things, there is a really conceptual uh, a part about data, which her key point is that there's no such thing as raw data. Right? That's a philosophical point. The idea is whatever the data you have, you collect it for a purpose. You, you already think about how to collect them, how to measure them. There are a lot of things are that there's a human construct already there. The, the whole idea to emphasize that is, you know how sometimes we emphasize, oh, it's a, I, you know, it's, you know, I let data to speak, right? You know, you know, let data speak, therefore it's very objective. From a philosophical point is that itself is never truly objective because there's always, even you decide what to collect, already inferenced, essentially it's, essentially has a selection component in, into it. So that's sort of the, from very beginning, what's very interesting is that uh, after, you know, the genetics, the whole, whole, whole part, this is a, a, Chris, a Christine, uh, Bogman, she is a guru in, uh, in uh, information science, library science, and her point from a li librarian science perspective is talk about what she called the afterlife of the data, which is very important. These days we talk about open access, open science, right? The idea of open science is uh, whatever data I collect, I let everybody else to sort of use as, as a part of it. But if you think about that, it turned out to be that it's not that easy just to use somebody else's data. Right? You need to know how they collected it, how they documented it. There are a lot of things about data curation, data province, is actually not the typical things that we even teach. But this is exactly what the, what the librarians you know, do. There's about how to preserve something historical so others can, you know, can use. So there's a lot of a really scholarly uh, uh, approach to think about how do you pr uh, preserve the data as well as with their entire record. And this has turned out to be also a crucial topic these days in this whole thing called reproducible, replicable you know, science. Because you need to check what other people do, what are they doing. And then most of you know, when you do studies, you probably don't keep a record of everything. Okay? I don't think anybody could. And even think about how to, how to keep that. How, how do you know that I've saw some notes, like I made some decision along the ways. These are all important in the end. If you think about this holistically as the whole process, but the record, how to record those things, how to keep a record of those things, are just, are just incredibly hard, right? So this is the, you know, this is the sort of approach, like sort of after everything you talk about the, the, the afterlife of data. The reason I want to mention both these things, both the philosophical thinking and this kind of a library uh, approach, these are obviously very relevant, very crucial for doing the data science as a whole. But I don't think we stat statistics department teach those things, or not even in compu computer science department teach those things. So you really have to think about data science in a, in, 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 in a, in, in a more broad uh, a way. So my, my sort of the, the punchline for my editorial was really to emphasize that by now, the term data science has been evolved into a way, in a way that the way I'm thinking about a DS is no longer a discipline by itself. It's very much like an umbrella term. 
So what do I mean by that? So there's a consequence of that. I'm actually really saying, I know there are universities thinking about creating Department of Data Science. I would say, don't do that. Because you'll be squeezing all those into one department. It's not going to work well. Now, the analogy I'm making here is you probably have all heard about there are terms called a science and a scientist, but you rarely see a department of science. Right? You, you, will have a, you, you, you will have a department of biology, department of physics, right? Because it's that become an umbrella term, and you have social science as a social scientist, you rarely see a department of social science, unless you're in a very small college, sometimes they lump all the things together, right? The point then is you have the terms humanities and the humanists, right? And you really see a department of, of humanities. Um, the last one got myself slightly into trouble. I was telling people like, you know, there are engineers and engineers, but they're really a department of engineer, except I was giving this talk um, about a week ago at the University of Cambridge. And they do have a department engineer. So everybody was laughing. But you know, department, their department is really like a college, literally a college. But the point, I, I, you know, I, hope, you, I hope you get my, my point, because the field becomes too big. There are so many components that if you're trying to squeeze everything into one department, what, you, what, what, happen, what, what will happen is you'll be teaching everybody a little bit of everything and then nothing really in, you know, uh, really in depth. And so the way I've been thinking about this thing is really think about medical schools, right? Medical school, you, 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 you do the training for the generalists, but you also have also all sorts of specialists. And that, I think that's the right model to, to think about because we need a lot of sort of data science generalists, very much like a medical generalist, that they look at the problem, they can diagnose it. They can say, you should see a heart specialist, you should see a lung specialist. But they don't treat you themselves. I think we need a lot of those people to do those things. But we also need the specialists. We can't be all generalists. We all can do a little bit of something, but when we have real problem, serious problem, we cannot train them, right? And I sort of, just to end this part, um, was, uh, this I've heard uh, not too long ago, I was in a conference called International Dialogues on AI. Oh, that's another uh, term, so the, the hyper term. And uh, the, someone gives this, give this, I don't know whether it's a joke or whether it's, whether it's real. The idea was that um, there was this university that they were trying to get people to concentrate. This is what to recruit for undergraduate. So they basically said, if you want to solve all the problems in the world, major in computer science. Now, of course, all the statisticians get very agitated by that. Like, where are the statistics? But just wait, OK? This is when they're trying to recruit people to the undergraduate. Then, then they want to recruit people to the graduate study. And then they say, if you want to solve all the problems created by computer science, <laughs> now enroll in graduate study at any of these fields, right? If you think about it, this is actually pretty much true. <laughs> the reason we have all these problems now, algorithm fairness, accountability, all stuff, without the computer, we won't have any of the AI, any of data science, I mean, at least not at this scale. So this, this, is not quite, this is not quite wrong. I mean, it's a humorous line, but, but it is like a lot of problems is created by the computer science, and the rest of us need to really need to solve it. And I think the right structure, one of them at least, is the uh, Michael Jordans. Uh, you know, uh, being you, they have led this effort at the Berkeley started this thing called a, a data science division. And I said them got almost right is because they also have an interesting structure. They basically have the university-wise, have all the deans sort of report to this thing. The only thing is slightly weird, uh, that's historically, their uh, associate vice provost for this, uh, uh, for this school, for this division, is also the head of the I school. How many of you know what I school means? Information school. So that's a kind of a slightly weird s structure, but that's a, that's a historical thing at, the, at, at the Berkeley. But the basic point I'm making here is that uh, if you really want to do something like data science these days, uh, like what Harvard's doing, other places doing, we pretty much create a structure at the university level. Okay, you, because that's where, uh, because the data science has permeated into into so many different different uh, you, you, you know uh, you know different dimensions. Now, having emphasized that data science is very broad, now I want to come back to say we statistician can contribute a lot, right? I'm not saying that now it's it's just like anybody you know. Yes, anybody can be involved in data science, but stati statisticians, we can contribute a lot. And particularly, what I, you know, there's a deep statistical thinking is really very much needed. So the three problems I'm going to talk about, one is the predicting 2020 elections, which, uh, and I, I know you don't care that much, but somebody care. Uh, 
And I will talk about this in what I call the law of large population. You have heard about law of large numbers, but I'm talking about law of large population. I'm going to explain to you what that means. And I want to talk about a little bit about the defense of privacy of the 2020 census. And I think that that is something that's going to create a lot of uh, uh, you know, controversy, which already, already has created. There's a, then there, this is the thing, you know, I know that probably not much here. You have some, I understand, but it's a very intense in, in the United States. Essentially, everybody's trying to find the district to, to, to get themselves voted, okay, voted in. So, I'm gonna, so these are all being posed, posed some really interesting statistical questions. They are all, you know, they're, they're not really much mathematics involved. Oh, this one has a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of things that are very simple, very basic ideas. I'm going to talk about using simply mean, correlation, variance concept, but the, the statistical thinking goes a long way. Okay. I don't think I have a time to talk about these two, which is I added. One is about divide conquer. One is a deep learning. How do you think of these issues that you sort of as you know as a statistician? But let me see if I can go through the first three. Okay. So um, this was I. This was a sort of a, a you know a picture uh, from Web the, the night before the 2016 uh, election. At that time, there was a lot of predictions of what's going to happen, where the Clintons win. I was very happy that this is not a Harvard, this is not a Harvard, OK? <laughs> I, first, I was worried about that, OK? So, but now, as some of you know, the 538 net silver ones uh, was, you know, he was the one did the lots of things that was very accurate. And my here is 72% is much better than, than the rest of them. But 72% is still pretty high, right? Especially if, you're, if, you're, you, if you want to win, 72% sounds pretty good, right? Now, so the point I want to make, and I want to say this is a very important point, is I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with each individual of them in some sense, because you know, any individual prediction we know could be wrong, because you know, we statisticians, the one good thing about statisticians, we never say anything for sure, right? So nobody can catch us to anything. We always say 99%. Well, this 1% is still pretty high. Okay, it could happen. What gets people into trouble is collectively you see so many medias, newsletter, news outlets. If everyone gives you this one thing, like you, have, you see that you know, again and again, you know, days, nights, weeks, all the same message, everybody would just say, okay, this is the reality. Right? And, but we all know what really happened in reality. Right? We, all, we were all surprised. by Regardless, this talk has nothing to do with ideology. I have to make that very clear. Regardless who you vote, who you don't vote, don't like, you always, whatever, whoever you are, you, you know, I hope you want to know the truth. Right? So this is a, about how do we think about statistical evidence here. OK, so uh, in order to address this, I want to take everyone back to something really old and really uh, profound, and I want to say why that was important and why that could mi mislead us. The first thing I want to say is really the law of large number, right? And, and uh, some of you know the law of large numbers is initially proved in a simple form by Benoli in 1713. And what the law of large numbers, there's a technical definition, as you all know. And for all the students, if you do not know what the law of large number is, don't tell anyone. Okay, uh, you, you will be kicked out of this department if you know. So, but fundamentally, the law of large number is set, right? There's a, you take a sample, small n, there's a large population, the capital N is a large population, and in the theory, eventually, the capital N is infinity. The idea is that if I keep sampling, we can eventually get it right, okay? That's all what the law of large number is saying in terms of the average. Now, mathematically, it's much harder than this, but that's the, that's the you know, essence of law of large number. That's not surprising at all. That's, you know, you probably don't need a mathematical theory. Most people would believe that. What's more interesting is the Dewar's central limit theorem. And again, if you don't know, just don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> 7033. And for me, what's important, uh, the, the, the Dewar's central limit theorem, is not just the bell shape. The bell shape is obviously important. That's fascinating. But there's a second message there is saying the error rate goes down as 1 over square root of the n, right? As statisticians, we all know this is by definition. No, no, just a, by default, we all understand that. Now, that's not obvious, right? That's not obvious. That says if you want to increase the, you, if you want to double, double your precision, you need to quadruple your, quadruple your sample size. And that kind of things, like if without the mathematical law, it's why, why is that, right? Now, we all understand that. But here's the problem, though. 
Now, I know that none of you sit there will be questioning this, right? Because this is this taught for all these years. But if someone walking that who had not studied statistics whatsoever, and if somebody is smart enough, look at this problem and say, there's something here is bizarre, right? Because this error rate is completely independent of capital N. That seems a little bit bizarre, is it? Should the arrow be related to the population size? Should it be the case that the larger the population, the harder it is to estimate? What makes us just to ignore the, the capital N? In fact, anyone who studied finite population survey literature, you will see you will, you know, there, there, is a, there is a called a finite sampling correction term. And the advice in general is that when N is large enough, ignore that. That's not just the complete opposite, right? If, if a, and is large, you know, don't worry about it. So, okay, so this is a question, okay? Now, I wanted to um, uh, bring back a little bit of also history on, on a survey. Um, this idea that take a small sample can infer the population, mathematically, you know, it was understood you know, long before it was actually being implemented. But when the idea in 1895, this was actually during the, I think it's the ISI, the Institute of Statistical, International Statistical Institute uh, Conference, 1895, by Anders, I can never pronounce this right, it's K.L. Kia. He was a statistical Norway's uh, you know, founder. When he proposed this idea, uh, using a sample size of n to infer a population size of capital N, this was later described as an intellectually violent revolution. Because if you think about it, we now all take that for granted. But if you have never learned these things, think about, like for example, US, US has 320 million people, right? And the idea that you can sample 5,000 5, people, or even 500, can learn 320 million people, initially, everybody say, you're, you're insane. Right? How could that possibly be? Okay? And in fact, this idea really was not just got accepted immediately until really, pretty much until Maurice Hansen uh, at the U.S. Census Bureau when this was implemented in 1940 in, in, the, in, the sam in sampling. And once this happens, as you probably all understand, once it becomes you know, a, a government agent impl implement this, and this becomes really a, a standard, common standard, right? Now these days, if you do the social science work, this is a, doing surveys, doing questionnaireing, that's the sort of basic methodological approach, right? But it really took about 50 years to, uh, to really become this uh, uh, popular approach. And the reason I mention this, this, this is what I could talk about a little bit about the, the 2020 census about defense privacy. What I was thinking about, that's another intellectually violent revolution is going to take place uh, next year. But so let me first try to explain to you, uh, now, let's say someone do not understand this thing, say, well, how can you explain to me why I can take uh, you know, a, such a small sample to really make inference of a population regardless of the population size? Um, well, here is a very easy way to, to understand this thing. And I think particularly, I see lots of Chinese here, Chinese students here. We all love like huntun or noodles or the soups, right? Okay. Suppose you are asked to taste a soup. Is it, is it salty enough or is it delicious enough, right? What do you do? You mix the soup well and a few spoons is all you need, right? If regardless whether it's a tiny soup or it's a gigantic soup, right? The container makes no difference after you mix the well. Is that clear? After you mix the well, that's all you need is a little bit. Okay? And that's pretty much is why this thing working. The whole idea is, is a homogeneity, right? If it's a homogeneous, it's a little bit you want. So now, in real life, you can't really mix in you know, people. Well, what the statistician invented is called a randomization, right? The whole randomization is essentially a physical device to make everything representative, okay? So as simple as that. But here is one problem though, one problem that we all have ignored this too long and it's coming back to really buy us, right? The problem is that even go back to think about physically. Think about physically you stir a small soup, as long as it's not too small, too small is hard to, a, a soup and a gigantic bucket, right? It's much harder to stir a really big ones. Right? But once you mix them well, 
you assume the way the whole problem. So now everything else we do is saying, OK, assuming it's well, it's a statistical representative, then let's find all the statistical errors. right? But then the, this is where the size of capital N sort of goes away. So my point here is that the, what I'm going to present to you is that once you take into account that it did not do well, then you will see that the thing is much, much trickier. Okay? What statistician is known is called a selection bias. Okay, non-response bias, selection bias. What I've done here is to quantify this being less lack of head, you know, homogeneity, how much damage it can do. Is that clear? Okay, so that's what I was going to do. All right. So in order to do that, that's why we're going to need the black ball there. But uh, let me first show you the real data from the 2016, 2016 elec election. So what I show here is a z-score, because there's a 50 states plus the DC. There are 51 data points. These are the abbreviations of, of each state. What I'm plotting here, the, the y-axis here, is the actual difference between what was predicted by survey what would actually the vote, divided by the standard deviation, pretend it's simple random sampling. So it's like a standard z-score, OK? So on the left side, the y side, that's, that's the z-score. Here is the log of the total number of people turn out to vote in that state. So that's the population size, how many people actually voted, OK? What you see here, you see this interesting phenomena. This is the traditional plus or minus two, 95% bend. Okay, you see what happened is the arrows are getting larger and larger as the state size, as the more people vote, the more arrow was in that prediction. This is quite different than the traditional way of thinking about it's a small sample cause more variation. No, here is the large population size. The more the, the larger the population, and this is the data, this is real data, you can anyone can can, can make this plot. So I did not discover this. I was doing theory. This was, the theory tells me this is going to happen. Then retrospectively, I found the data, and this actually really happened. So what I'm going to tell you is what the theory behind this, that why this is happening. OK? So this should give you insight about, this is what I call the law, law of large population. The large population is going to destroy you because the capital N is coming back. OK? So let me show you how this works. So what I need here is what I call a, a fundamental a trivial but a fundamental identity. And that's where I need a good blackboard to, to illustrate a little bit. Imagine the following, okay? That each of you, I'm gonna ask each of you, pretend you're in the United States, I'm gonna ask each of you, like, you know, are you gonna vote for Trump? If you say you're gonna vote for Trump, one. Okay? If no, not you say, if you will be voting for Trump, is one. And if you do anything else, including say I voted for somebody else, I don't want to tell you, whatever it is, is zero. OK? Uh, not, not I don't want to. If, if I have not decided, everything is zero. So I just, just die, economists die. Uh, the formula itself does not require that, uh, that, uh, that being binary, but it's much easier to, uh, to illustrate that. Now, the, the next quantity is the one that it's, it's entirely trivial for any of us who have done survey literature research or uh, in, in this sort of missing data literature, but it may not be familiar for others. The idea here is that each of you also has what I call, there's a response indicator. If you tell me your answer, whatever your answer is, and if, assuming you tell me honestly, if you, if, if you don't tell me honestly, that's an entirely different story. Okay, that's a much harder problem. If you tell me honestly, your R is one. But if you refuse to give me answer, you just, you just, you just refuse, right? And then the, this R is zero. Is it clear? So each one of you have two variables, your, your true voting opinions and your response behavior, whether you do or not. Because each one you have the two variables, there's a correlation between them, just simple, linear, uh, simple Pearson correlation. So here's the formula, OK? And this formula may look a little bit, little bit mysterious. And, uh, and I'm going to show you here very quickly because it's very easy to show it. But this is the fundamental formula that is going to tell you, the, tell you the whole story. Here is the difference between the sample mean, how many people in my sample tell me they're going to vote for Trump. This is the one I want to estimate. This is the population mean. It turns out the difference between them can be written as the correlation between X and R. How correlated is your answer to your reporting behavior? 
This quantity is entirely determined by the size of your, uh, uh, you know, your sample relative to the, to the population. And this is entirely determined, has nothing to do with the survey, this, this, in the population, how opinions vary. Okay? I'm going to show you this is, a, this is a mathematical identity. No assumption is required. But uh, let me first tell you what are the consequences of, of this thing. This tells you that the or statistical error, actual error, is determined by three quantity and only three quantity. First, let me go this way, is what I call the problem difficulty index. If everybody is of the same opinion, you just need to take one person. You learn everything. Okay? So you can see that if everybody has the same opinion, this is zero, there's no error. So the larger is this standard deviation, the harder is the problem. And we understand that, right? The sigma, that's a sigma. And uh, this part is also pretty easy to understand, right? Because, you know, if I have nobody in my sample, this goes blow up, because nothing to estimate. If everyone in my sample, every in the, everybody in the population is in my sample, and they responded uh, honestly, this is zero, right? Okay? So this controls the quantity. So this controls the problem difficulty, this quantity. This is a relatively new term, and this is the one I'm going to talk most, most about it. This is what I call the quality, quality index. Because if it's a really random sample, whether you are in, the, in my sample or not is not determined by your answer. It's determined by a random device. But if after you, I take you and you decide, because you don't like other people to see your answer, you decide to refuse to answer me, you, you inject this correlation. The larger this correlation, the more biased it is. Is that clear? So this is what I call that data Data, what I actually, there's a term I use called a, that's a data defect correlation. But this is the, this is the one that explains all these selection bias. It's all loaded here because this R essentially could include all kinds of reasons why you get excluded. But uh, collectively, everything is this term. Okay? Now let me show you very quickly uh, where this formula comes from because this is actually uh, a kind of a slight trick, but but it's a, you know, it's a very important one. Typically, we write this one, usually we write as something like this, right? i equal to 1 to n x i, right? That's a typical way we write that's the sort of sample mean. But in this calculation that you don't write this way, you write this in terms of the population average. You, you put everybody in, but you multiply by the indicator. If it's a 1, it's in. If it's a 0, it's out. Right? Then you divide it by the total number of people who are in, which is the sum of the i. Right? Okay? By doing that, what you get is, if you, if you think about taking average is like an expectation with respect to the index, uniform index, this becomes index expectation of r times x divided by index expectation of r. Right? And then you minus, so this is the xn bar, but the capital xn bar is simply the index of the entire x itself, right? So now you see the difference between them. If you do the difference between them, what you get is the difference between them is this thing. Now, I hope you still remember how to take the common denominator. If you take a common denominator, the denominator is expectation of the r. But the, now the numerator is the expectation of the product minus the product of expectation. And anyone who has studied statistics, again, if you don't know, tell, don't know if don't tell anyone, that's the covariance, right? So now you have that is the that is the covariance of r and x divided by this mean of r. But it's a covariance. You standardize by the, the standard deviations, right? And because R is, is binary, you got the P times the 1 minus P kind of binary formula. That's why you get the correlation, then you get everything else. OK? Is that clear? Now, in real life, before the election really took place, I cannot calculate this thing from the sample. Because everyone in my sample, R equal to 1. Right? But after the election, it's the beauty of the election, I would know what the, what the truth is. I can back calculate what this correlation is. I can tell you, back calculate how much people selected to respond. Okay? 
And that's what I'm going to use the 2016 data to show you. And what was the correlation there? That definitely there was a correlation. Without a correlation, we would not have any surprise. Okay. Any, is it, this clear? This is the fundamental. If you don't remember anything else, that's a formula you should remember. Okay. It's a formula. Because this is going to help you to understand all these things. So here's what I did. I applied this to the 2016 election data. And this was a data, was a survey data was conducted by actually YouGov, and it's called a co Cooperative Congressional Election Study. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen and, and Solibear, he is a leading uh, uh, a scholar in the American election. He's the one behind the CBS calling that the selection, that election night, he's the one behind the scene calling everything. He's my colleague at the government department at, the, at, the, at the Harvard. And he's the, he's the kind of wonderful colleagues that when you hire, I know you have six, call, six positions to, to, to hire. This is the kind of people you want to hire because when I ask him to give me the data, he not only give me the data, he give me his assistant. <laughs> That's the kind of colleague you want because it's wonderful. All right, so actually I wrote this whole article. This is online, you can get it. It's all the formula, all the things is in that article. But here I'm going to show you what really happened, okay? So remember I can do the back calculation row in terms of z-score, okay? So once I have this thing, I can do the, do the calculation. Now here is what happened. This was people to answer predicting Clinton's, whether you vote for Clinton or not, okay? Taking Clinton as one and anything else, including not making decision, is zero, right? Over the 50 states plus DC, you will see this correlation is pretty much centered around zero. You never expect exactly zero, right? Because there's always a little bit of estimation, but it's spread in this way, okay? You can see the standard deviation is on the another order of, uh, 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 you know, you know uh, uh, actually this number, this number actually is, oh no, no, this is fine, yeah. So this is for Clinton. Here's what happened for Trump. You see, the thing is shifted. So now it's centered around about a 0.5%, a half percent correlation. Keep that in mind. The correlation was a half percent. You can't publish an article and say, I found a correlation half percent. Most time, you know, you just can't, okay? They will reject you, all right? But I'm gonna show you how much damage this 0.5 half percent of correlation has caused. Is that clear? So this is from real data. Okay. So now here's what I do. Now I'm going to ask like, what is the consequence of have this half percent? I'm going to convert it into something called effective sample size. Okay. So the idea here is that now I know there's a data set with this half percent of correlation, which I know is bad, but I can have another data set which have no correlation. I want to ask. A, a data set with half percent correlation in terms of mean square errors predicting this election outcome, what's the equivalent sample size if I did not have that, that correlation? That gives you a sense. We know that it's going to reduce the sample size. That's because the error. But how much reduction is there? So that's the, that's the calculation. All right? So here's what I did. What I did is to say, OK, let me, well, you, you can just do the effect of some, you, you match these two mean square errors, you can solve for it, and you can get this expression. It's literally just one of the row square, the correlation. And this F is the relative size, not the absolute size, okay? So this is actually also important to tell you, when people talk about big data in this kind of population inference problem, what's big, you should ask, is not the absolute size, is the relative size, how big it is, how, ma how much percentage of the population you cover. Okay. Now, so here is a little bit of thing I did. So what I did is, I look at about two to three months before the 2016 election, and uh, every day you will have 20, 30, sometimes 50 surveys somewhere. So I look at all of them and say, suppose I put all of them together. How many people's opinions do I actually have? I did a rough calculation, probably it's overestimation. It's about 1% of the voting population. It's about 2.3 million people, okay? Now, to put things in, in, in perspective, 2.3 million, million people means what? Means about 2,300 pools, and each of them has 1,000 people. Now, imagine you have opinions from all these places. That seems a lot, right? I have 2,300 pools, each has 1,000. Suppose you're working for any of these uh, uh, candidates' uh, uh, you know, campaign. If you say, I have this many opinions, if they all tell me one thing, I'm pretty sure either I'm going to lose or I'm going to win, okay? But now, 
I am going to put this into the formula, F equal to 1%, rho equal to 0.5. Someone should be able to do very quickly. Guess what's the answer to the saying? About 400. And that is not a factorial sign. Okay. <laughs> so what has happened here is that that 0.5% of correlation actually destroyed 99.98% of the sample size. You just had a tiny bit of sample size. I'm not saying that 400 data point is not useful. A good survey with the 400 tells me a lot. But your confidence should be entirely changed. You're not going to say, I'm done. If I tell you that uh, you're the, the, the worstness of your answer, statistically I can show you, mathematically I show you, is equivalent to a very good survey with, with the 400. Would any campaign stop saying, oh, I'm done with the 400? No. But when you say, I have 2,300, each with 1,000 people, that sounds a lot, right? So all I'm showing you is that, that this, what this says is the trade-off between quality and the quantity is very extreme. Once you don't still well, it's actually physical. If you have some chunk of salt stuck somewhere, it takes a lot larger uh, many spoons to find it than just sort of a few tiny spoons. Okay. And uh, um, so this is what, I, what I've been calling the big data paradox. I said, if you don't take data quality into account, the big the data, the sure we fool ourselves, right? Because what happened here is when the data size is very large, all these confidence intervals become very, very tiny, right? Because the, the width is inverse with the squares. But they are centered at the wrong place. So what happens? You guarantee yourself never get it right. And the more the data, the, the tiny these intervals are, right? In fact, that is a law of large number because it's, it's a law of large number. I'm going to confirm, confirm, but it's confirming the bias if you don't know how to shift it, right? And another way of thinking about this, and this is what I call the law of large population, is the z-score here is written as rho times this thing. So you can see, if the rho is zero, it doesn't matter what the, what the population size is. By doing sterling well, is essentially make the rho zero, or technically, is making the rho is one over square root n, that kind of rate. So this will be on the order of one or two. That's what the z-score is, like one or two. But once this guy is fixed, because the self-selection kind of bias, then the larger the population, the more the bias gets show up. That's what you see why these big states started having more, more things. So this is what I call the, the data. So another way of thinking about this, this is really the large, is another way of thinking about this is really thinking about if you're gonna sh aim in the moon, like a tiny bias, tiny arrow here, as you go away, but then is it going to be multiplied? So you will never see the moon, right? Okay. So uh, what I'm hoping is people really start thinking about thinking about this role and to think about paying attention to these large states because it is these large states that kind of selection bias is going to um, cause you know real problem. Uh, but now let me in the next 10 minutes to say very quickly these two other issues which are incredibly interesting. One is this whole thing called the differential privacy for 2020 census is what I think is, should be labeled as intellectually violent second revolution. What do I mean by that? This is, this is John Abel. He is the associate director of Census Bureau leading this whole, he's like the, the technical leader of the 2020 census. In a very simple term, the 2020 census is going to be released that you, will never, you don't see any real data because they're going to add noise to all the data they released, except the, I think the federal total and each state total. That's the constraint, okay? So what is, the, what is this causing differential privacy? There is a technical term by it. Let me just show you what this term is. This is a slightly a little bit mathematics. The idea is say, whatever you're calculating, let's say you're calculating a sample, like a population, uh, calculating a, a, a sort of sample mean, and the idea is that I can calculate sample mean with a person in it, and I can take out that person to read through the calculation. And if statistically, these two things in terms of their distribution only differ by a tiny amount, you cannot tell who was in, who was out. That's called a differential privacy. It's literally a derivative idea. Like I take a tiny perturbation, see how much it changes on the distribution. If the derivative is small, I'm fine. 
Okay? So what they do is now, they send to the bureau, they will, they will choose some epsilon. It's a lot of discussion how they choose that. Then basically they will be injecting the noise into whatever these, these accounts they are going to produce to make sure that this is satisfied. Okay? This is called a differential privacy protected sensors. Now, you will see well, what's the controversial here. There's already outcry from the social scientists say, well, now you're going to give me all the data to analyze that all have noise in it, right? And how do I know these noise are not destroying? Right. What's interesting is that, okay, so this is, a, this is actually the, the Cynthia Dork, my colleague at Computer Science at Harvard, is the, one, is the leading, act, leading uh, scholar in, in this whole idea of defense privacy. I think she's the one put down. The idea is really not that new, but she's the one put down the sort of mathematical foundations and to show how do you do that, typically adding like a Laplace arrows to show mathematically why these things are fall. Um, so this is a clearly a trade-off between information and the privacy. The previous revolution is much about information and the cost trade-off, right? The idea I only take a little sample instead of a whole population is a, a tremendous saving in terms of human resource, everything. So, so these are all, in real life, these problems are all, always about a trade-off. But now, there's a different trade-off. But what's interesting here is that, you know, the US Constitution require you collect the data accurately and also require you protect everybody's privacy. You know, laws are law. Now, the rest of us need to struggle, like how do you actually implement that? So that's a, the, the very question here is, what is the trade-off here? This actually has a deep connection with statistics, even this idea itself. Uh, this is like, a, remember, some of you know the random response. You, don't, you flip a coin. If it's one side, you, you say to choose. If not, that's kind of related. There's a whole idea of robust statistics. It's very much related. If you think about, you know, there's enough air, noise added. There's also something which I don't have time to talk about. It's also very much it's the idea of taking der derivative with respect to, to some data, now with respect to parameter uh, into measure selection effect. But what I also want to mention is that this is a, first it already has a lot of reactions. This was an article written in the New York Times about you know, just causing people panic, say, to reduce, to reduce privacy risk, the sensor plan to report less accurate data. The person who wrote it is Mark Hansen, who is an actual statistician. I, I wish Mark did not use the word less accurate, but rather less precise. Okay? There's a difference between them, right? But this opened up a lot of re research problems. I said, people talk about low-hanging fruit. I said, there are lots of fruits on the floor. You just pick them up. Uh, robust estimators, inference function, the traditional taken derivative was found. It's all very much there. There's another area, I know some of you work on this here as well. It's called a whole imprecise probability. Because this idea essentially, think about these, every, these bounds. Essentially, you're creating bounds on probabilities. So in this single, there's a whole literature on, on uh, one of my colleagues, uh, one of my former students, uh, Robin has been just wrote this recent article. It's very interesting. ABC is called approximated Bayesian computation. So what she shows that when you do approximate Bayesian computation for the purpose of doing the computation, that it's equivalent to doing exact computation for the approximate data. So there's a so you can use this tech, technology from ABC to do this Bayesian computation now with you know with the noise data. The idea is that you either add a noise at adding the noise at the data level, or you add the noise at the sort of computation level, there is a correspondence to them. The reason I mention this is trying to encourage everyone, particular students, that there are lots of low-hanging fruit that, to work on it, because the data has not been released yet, but we're anticipating that's, you know, that this is going, this is going to happen. The last one I want to talk about very briefly is this whole idea of a redistricting or called a gerrymandering. And I think probably these, these picture tell, tells all. This is actually is from Chicago. This I think is a Chicago Council election. The whole idea is that you know we have all these different parties, right? Republican, Democratic, and everybody wants them to have more, more, more winning vote. But you know how do you restrict these districts is very important because if you're in a place which is, you're 40 percent, you could be in many places you're all 40 percent. But if you connect all these 40 percent into one district, it's all your voters, then you become like a lot more people, right? So what happened is that you create because of that, depending on which party is in control, you you see these kind of district that can create it, you look like ridiculous, like why did they avoid all those things, right? And this is not, a, this is not the most ridiculous one. You have seen some of them really like a snake, 
No, they go, right? And now you say, well, what's the regulation here? Well, there are regulations, but these regulations are vague. These are written by politicians and the lawyers. They will say, for example, the requirements say, this district needs to be relatively compact. Now, what does that mean? That these are not a mathematical compactness, right? not a convexity. You know, it's not compactness. But so how do you implement that? How do you implement this sort of relatively? Uh, uh, so here is what people have been doing, right? People say, OK, now how do I know this one is too extreme? Imagine I have a mechanism to generate the many, many of these districts. Okay? And on each district, I'm going to calculate, for example, what's the percentage of the Republican vote in that thing. So I can have a, I can have a calculated statistics from any district plan. Then I can get a histogram, right? I can get the histogram of, I basically like simulate the null dis distribution, right? All the possible plan, and each one of them has a the numbers. Then I want to see, like, where's yours? It's very much like hypothesis testing, right? Is it in the tail? Okay? The only thing that makes this whole thing so interesting is, there's not agreed upon the Nordic distribution. There's nothing like you know, the parties would agree. Everybody agree some regulation is needed. They don't want everyone to go, go completely crazy. Because they know that you know, when you are in control, you can go completely crazy. But be careful, next time somebody else is in control. So they all need some rules. Okay? They want to have some rules in place. But these rules are not enough to guarantee a well-defined law distribution. And nevertheless, they want to do things like this. So there's a whole group of people, which is mostly a, a, a mathematician. And they do a lot of MC, MC, and I call it more complicated MC, MC. So this is a, a Mooducin from Tufts University. And this is, what is, this is an illustration. What, what they do is they create these, these MCMCs. Like they change the, the naive ones. They basically change one district at a time. One neighbor at a time. So you create this Michael chain, not, not a classic way with statistician. What we do is we have a stationary distribution, then we create the Michael chain. For them, it's just construct a rule. Right? So these are different, different people construct different rules. And this is created by Mooching's group. You see their rules, like in terms of the same number of iteration, this starting point, these rules are not even getting close, but this looks much better, like in terms of creating things. But how do I know this is actually correct? Right? These MCMC rules can get stuck somewhere. Right? So, but nevertheless, they have been using these kind of rules. For example, they show this. They wrote an amicus brief for the Supreme Court case uh, happened not too long ago. They, they show like these, these are like the distribution created by these, uh, these, these simulations. And they show how these different parties creating these plans, they are all like in the tail. And there was, there was a judge suggest some plans, which seems like a much more neutral. Now, these are all fine. Except that you know, the lawyers are going to debate in, in the court. If I'm the defense lawyer, or not, defense, not necessarily defense, the other side lawyer, I can question like, where did this distribution come from? What's the theory behind it? Because there's, right? And then, and, but nevertheless, what happened is this kind of thing actually is used by, this is, this is you know, Supreme Court Judge Kagan. And um, she wrote this, she actually dis dissented in this case. But when she used it, she actually said, the approach, which also has recently been used in Michigan and Ohio litigation, begin by using advanced computing technology to randomly generate the large collection of district plans that incorporate the state physical and political geography. So these are things are used as, in a court as evidence, right? For, you know, for, for judges, these are all advanced state of computing, but all we're doing is this MCMC. Now, so this creates an incredibly interesting kind of a statistical problem, which is very much related to this imprecise probability. I want to say a few words. Is essentially you have a situation, the null distribution is not well specified, but there's some restriction to it. And in that case, how do you say somebody's plan is too extreme for that kind of uh, vaguely defined? Okay? Because nobody knows how to define this thing. It's all subject to, to debate. But uh, statistically, there's something can be done. So this goes beyond the traditional hypothesis testing against the null distribution. So you can think about maybe there's a, a, you know, a class of the this kind of null distribution. They all satisfy some notion of vaguely uh, uh, sort of what they call the uh, 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 relatively compact. And, but if you can show that this point you create is extreme against this entire class, Maybe that is a strong evidence, right? Because you know some of the plan is going to be so ridiculously bad. Right? But the, the thing is, like, they, in the court, so interesting because we statisticians usually don't get into that point, that they need something. You cannot say that that looks terrible to me, 
right? That, that, that's not a scientific evidence. They want to create some kind of wave to think about this scientific evidence to say, well, this is really going too far, or this is acceptable. But that kind of problem, I think we need a lot more of us to work on, because they are, they are pushing the boundary. They are pushing the boundary in the sense that they use the kind of properties, this is a, very much the MCMC property calculation, but they are, they are in this domain of being very vague. And a lot of real life problems is being just very vague, but you still need to do something about it. So that's how, what I'm really hoping that at least I can motivate some of the students to working on these uh, much more challenging problems. And in the end, there's not even a unique answer. In the end, you probably will be, the best you can do is to be a court expert to, to go there to testify. Now that, that induced entirely a different, uh, different issue of uh, education is you need the better communication skills to, to argue with all these lawyers. So, but the, the, the thing I want to show this problem is like there are a lot of deep steps of thinking is needed, and these all now belong to this big domain called the data science, right? But we can contribute a lot. And I have not talked about anything today about, you know, lassos, any fancy stuff. But you can see the basic concept of bias, variance, correlation, if you think it the right way, goes a really long way. Thank you very much.